Hi, good morning, everyone out there. Uh, my name is Megan Decker, and I'm the chair of the Oregon Public Utility Commission. Uh, I just yesterday celebrated my five-year anniversary as a commissioner, and I'm reflecting uh, this morning that transmission is one of those very difficult subjects that, uh, well, I've learned a lot over those five years. I recognize that my knowledge and, and certainly my takes on the subject remain somewhat impressionistic and, and maybe a little idiosyncratic grounded in what I've run into in my role as an Oregon commissioner. So um, this impressionistic uh, uh, portrayal of transmission lines behind um, me is meant to remind you that uh, that is where I'm coming from. And I hope that we have some time for uh, Q&A to sort of um, unpack or challenge uh, some of the things that I'll say this morning. Why is transmission planning and development coordination in the West important, uh, grounded for uh, grounded in where I'm coming from? I think of it as, as two reasons. One, so we can have more confidence that we're making good decisions about costs and impacts. And two, so we can have more confidence that we can meet our policy goals. And those may be primarily addressing climate change, reducing greenhouse gases. They may also be economic development, uh, community impacts, things like that. Um, so on the first goal, why do I think uh, transmission planning and, and regional transmission planning is important to having more confidence that we're making good decisions about costs and impacts? Um, as I'm sure you know, regulators, utility regulators have the task to determine uh, whether transmission costs are reasonable enough to pass on to people who use electricity, just as siting officials have what I think might be even the harder task of accepting some land impacts in, in pursuit of a, a larger scale need. And I, as a decision maker, want to know that projects that come in for cost recovery, probably just like those who want to make siting decisions, I want to know that those are the best long-term investments for the region as a whole, uh, that they are the most economically efficient way of meeting needs that I and the stakeholders that um, are important to the commission's process have had a chance to define and vet. Um, and I want, um, once we have that confidence, uh, all beneficiaries of regionally significant projects to be at the table for a fair and transparent cost allocation discussion. Um, we know that when you start looking at these, it, really any transmission projects, but, <laughs> but, um, but certainly those that are larger and more regionally significant, that the benefits flow throughout the region. This isn't a point A to point B conversation. And uh, I think uh, planning can do a better job of helping us understand um, what those benefits are and therefore how, how we should allocate the costs. So the second thing I said is that I wanna have more confidence that we can meet our policy goals. Um, Oregon, like Washington, has ambitious clean electricity legislation, tagline 100% clean by 2040, lots, lots more to it as, as with your, your law uh, there in Washington. And, and there is, putting it mildly, a, a, a lack of confidence that um, we have the grid that is best suited to meet those multi-decade longer term policy goals and, and, and certainly to do so at the lowest um, possible cost and, and, and or, or the highest value if you want to think of it that way. Um, I, I can talk about some of the reasons why I think that confidence how that confidence can grow and, and what we can do to increase that confidence but but I, I think it's really important that um, uh, we be able to have a, a good transparent look further out in the future at um, trade-offs. 
where resources come from, different visions of that, uh, how they, who they benefit and, and, and impact in terms of economic development and environmental justice. And that's really the kind of um, scenario-based examination of uh, different possible futures that we're accustomed to in resource planning, integrated resource planning, using production cost models. I, I think that I understand somewhat at this point in my career why that is more challenging um, for transmission planning because you're using power cost uh, or sorry power flow modeling and I'm looking forward to hearing about that from one of our other speakers. But the fact is with transmission taking as long as it does to, to get developed, um, we, we need to have longer term uh, looks at where the region is going from a resource and load perspective. And even if we can't be certain about that so that we can start to understand the trade-offs among different transmission investments. Um, what is currently happening? I'm gonna just take one or two more minutes and then hopefully we can get into some dialogue. Um, I think of three, maybe four levels of transmission planning, uh, regional studies, order 1000 processes, and sort of single utility processes. Regional studies are, are things that I think of as being done by you know, the national labs. Um, perhaps WEC has been involved in those in, in the past and perhaps will be in the future. Um, I, I know that uh, the Western Interstate Energy Board is taking on some things to look at, at a higher level across the region at, at, at the resource future and the transmission needs that might be part of that. That's one area that we, oop, see, that was my timer for myself. <laughs> I can't make it go off. Um, okay. The second level is the Order 1000 uh, FERC mandated regional planning um, processes and, and theoretically the, the FERC mandated interregional planning that, that fits those together. There's a lot of conversation going on right now about how that can do more of what I was just talking about, look further in the future, have more scenario-based planning, um, uh, better uh, capture the range of, of costs and benefits. Um, uh, I want to thank um, uh, Kathleen and Joe and Ann Rendall and those from Washington that have leaned into Northern Grid, which is the our, our region's uh, uh, Order 1000 transmission planning process to, to try to be more involved and more engaged with each other and uh, get more out of that process. I think that there are potentially some bright spots there, and there's also a national conversation at the FERC level going on about how to sort of set higher expectations for those um, organizations, you know, overall. Um, the last layer is that kind of single utility, whether it's um, local planning or um, interconnection, that's where, that's where all of this kind of starts that 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 local planning process is what feeds transmission projects into the regional planning processes those are pretty opaque um you know th those are where the rubber meets the road and and there's not a lot of people uh watching or or, or in, in engaged in those so you know i'd like to see those that are responsible for um funding and thinking about how we do more in transmission you know help help us think as commissions um, you know, as advocacy groups, whatever, about how to resource engagement in some of that local planning. Obviously, the last layer is project by project um, interconnection requests or for BPA, the, the, the TSEP process, those are really important too for providing information. But when you're coming at it from a state and you're just trying to understand, for instance, as Oregon has been, how does offshore wind in Southern Oregon look in the region? How does it change the region? What transmission solutions you know, would, would be viable to, to help um, that develop? Uh, that's not a, you know, that, can, that kind of question can be asked when you have a single developer coming in, but, but sometimes you wanna ask those questions before that point. And, um, and, uh, and so I think maybe all, all of these places need more room for that. People are leaning into this conversation. I really recommend um, the 
Committee on Regional Electric Power Cooperation, the, the Krepsi YRAB meetings that are held twice a year. This upcoming one in at the beginning of May, we'll be talking a lot about uh, regional transmission um, issues um, and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation both uh, here and there. Thanks a lot. Great, um, Megan, thank you. So we've got uh, obviously some time for uh, questions here or comments. So um, I'm gonna invite folks um, uh, to uh, raise their hand by hitting Alt-Y to let me know they want to jump into the conversation if you have questions. Um, and then uh, I got a, a one here in the queue for you, uh, Megan, from uh, the chat. Um, the question is, could you summarize for the group at a high level um, uh, what is involved in production cost modeling? Wow, it, it will be a high level, and I'm, I'm <laughs> gonna, <laughs> I'll have to, I, I know someone is um, coming in to talk about flow-based modeling, and I bet the entire, you know, the first three things th th that they say will be about how uh, flow-based modeling is different from production cost modeling, um, but, um, it, you know, at, at a high level, I think um, it, it's really an economic model of you know how generation um, is dispatching and um, and and moving around uh, the region it tells you some things about where you might have transmission uh, congestion and and as it affects the the economics but it, it doesn't um, give you that sort of reliability level um, look um, that 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 a power flow modeling will give you where uh, transmission planners will sort of stress the system um, and see how it responds. Um, hope, I, I hope the next panelists can do a better job than that. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you, Megan. Uh, Glenn, and Glenn, if, if, if folks just don't mind quickly introducing yourself so uh, Megan, know who, Megan knows who she's talking to, that'd be great, Glenn. We go way back. Okay, no need then. <laughs> I, I remember Megan when she worked in Washington State, so there. I'm uh, Glenn Blackman, and I'm uh, from the Department of Commerce, the State Energy Office. And uh, thanks for your, your overview of that, Megan. Uh, we've been really interested in the possibilities of uh, inter-regional planning and development and um, have followed the, the, the work that's been going on at the federal level at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And one thing that I, I've been thinking about in that process is how different the Northwest seems compared to what um, FERC uh, thinks about and, and you know, kind of understands the dials that they can turn uh, with you know, regions that have um, organized wholesale markets like uh, you know, regional transmission organizations and where um, FERC actually, you know, regulates a lot of the, the participants in those markets. And in the Northwest, we don't really have an RTO. Some of the entities that are, you know, very important in our power system aren't regulated by FERC. How can we uh, capture some of those big benefits uh, given the way our system is organized right now, or what what do we need to do to to catch up with the rest of the country, if we, if anything? That's a great question, and and really the the you know the the question uh, as as it relates to coordination across the entire region. I guess I have kind of two answers. One is that if you look back to kind of the mid two thousands. The projects that we have that are moving through the process right now, I think came from this kind of regional study level <laughs> engagement that, that I was talking about. I think we have to look to, um, in the near term, to begin planning for kind of the next generation of um, transmission investments to the institutions that we have. I think we have to be talking about whether um, WEC can play a role, not in, um, in, in saying what has to happen in the region, but in giving us a little more visibility. Um, I, you know, I understand that Department of Energy, US Department of Energy has 
funds uh, for this. And, and I think how we use those is a, is a little opaque to me, but again, some of those extra utility, like above the utility level um, studies, are, I think are gonna have to be one way we do it. I mean, the other answer is, um, and people talk about whether the um, market development conversation, you know, can we really do this until we have a central uh, organized market across the West? I don't know. I mean, that's a good question, but we have to from my perspective. So I think that the market development conversations and the transmission planning conversations just somehow have to happen in parallel. I mean, they're happening in parallel right now. You know, the Western Interstate Energy Board is hosting an important conversation with Southwest Power Pool about their market development, you know, as we speak, um, and, and it's a lot of work um, for, for those of us that are following these things, but I, I think um, we can't wait, you know, for an RTO to do transmission planning, in part because um, it's not perfect, even when you have one centralized provider of, of transmission planning, and I think we're seeing that in the national discussion about how transmission planning is working well or less well in, in different organized markets. One more thing I'm going to say, um, CAISO um, is, you know, one bright spot that I would say is that the California Independent System Operator, which is the only, you know, organized market uh, or full organized market in the West right now, did recently have its transmission planning function do a 20-year study that does a little bit more of that kind of scenario work that, that I'm talking about. Um, and I think that them having shown the leadership to do that is starting to create some conversations about how the rest of the region can kind of um, take take a page from that playbook or, or fall in or do something kind of parallel. So I've got some bright spots and, and I think we're just going to have to sort of meddle through and use what we have. Um, but it's important to keep those market conversations going on in parallel from my perspective. Well, I really like that idea of uh, taking the, the model that California, uh, you know, that long-term plan and trying to do something like that uh, for the rest of the West or some some version of that. And, and I think there are, you know, fr from the USDOE perspective, I, and I don't, I'm not real connected in conversation with them, but I, I, it seems to me that there may be resources to do something like that with the, again, with the institutions that we have. So I think that's a promising direction. Okay, thanks.